Hey, Mr. good morning. How's it, how are you doing? I'm good. Right. Welcome to Inventing Daily with Carolyn Kane. This is episode 12. And today I have with me Rodrigo Lima, who's the owner of Lime Design. Yay, love the logo in the back. <laughs> it's a South Florida based uh, full, full service product development company. And you do a lot more than what I thought, which was prototyping. So I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the business and sure. what else you do besides the great prototyping that I know you do. All right. So thank you uh, for inviting me onto your show. I've um, been looking forward to speaking with you for some time now. And um, yeah, I love that question, how, you know, how I got started in the business. So I've always kind of been a tinkerer. Um, I used to study international business and minoring in Spanish when I first started college and didn't really know what I wanted to do exactly. But I always kept taking some of these creative classes, the photography, the uh, ceramics classes, which really helped me a lot, and uh, woodworking classes. I would just keep taking them because my parents were paying for school, so I just wanted to take all the cool classes while I'm doing the math and accounting stuff that was going on. And um, one day I was home for the summer, and um, I was at FIU at the time, and I, was, I came to Pittsburgh for the summer, and they have the Art Institute of Pittsburgh there. And I just looked inside the window when I was walking by the city in the downtown, and I just loved everything I saw inside there, a bunch of different special effects and product designs that were developed by the students. And from that day, it was like the first day of the rest of my life. Um, I took a loan out in my name and uh, started at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale about six months later. And uh, the rest is history. Um, I worked, for, and, uh, just I guess to give you a little bit of kind of like work I've done since then, um, you know, right out of school, I worked with uh, two NASA engineers at a company called Morrison Pump Company. Um, two really smart guys that uh, basically started their own firm after they worked at NASA for a while. Uh, so I worked with them for five years. I got really good at all the software and, and creating technical drawings and understanding things like an engineer looks at things, um, which is nice to have when you're used to just, you know, you know, more of what it looks like, you know, and you need to have everything together, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, from, from there, I worked for another company called Ironbridge Tools for about six years. I developed hundreds of screwdrivers, flashlights, measuring tapes, all sorts of devices and um, dealing with plastic and metal and rubber, silicone. And uh, from there, you know, it was time, I felt like it was time to start my own thing. And I created Lime Design. I wanted to take all the things that I didn't like when I worked for other people. And I wanted to create my own, you know, work experience for my team and try to create amazing products and, and keep people as um, happy and focused as, as possible. And, and that's, that's what we're doing at Lime Design. Well, I know you work with a lot of, um, I'll call them startups or inventors, and I know you do a lot of work in prototypes. But once a, a, an inventor has a, a prototype, and let's say you've made it for them, what is actually the next step? Because, uh, you know, inventors get focused on one thing and then they accomplish it okay now now what do I do well I mean I guess at all stages in the projects the inventor needs to be looking for funding um, you know whether as soon as you can start getting funding it makes inventing a lot easier because you know it's an expensive um, you know it's a business it's not a it's not a hobby right so you know if you have depends to, on the inventor <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But so, yeah, well, regardless, it's expensive. So it's even more expensive if it's a hobby, because if you actually want to really do something with it, you need to figure out how to scale it up and how to get a licensing deal. Those are kind of two different options. Either you're going to manufacture it or you're going to try to get a licensing deal from somebody else that's going to handle all the work and you get a check. And it's, you know, it's, it sounds great. It's not always the easiest way to go, you know, but it's, it kind of depends on, on every product, right? But when you're going for funding, well, I'll use your example, there's so much more you need. I mean, you know, to show my product, uh, which I did at the National Hardware Show, you still need <clears throat> a logo yeah, yeah. or should have a logo. You've got yeah. to have to have a name that isn't taken. My first show, I uh, had Paint Smart and had T-shirts made up, had banners, had everything. And I had a company come up to me and say, ah, you can't use that. <laughs> it's our brand. Little did I know because it was a long time ago and uh, I didn't have anybody guiding me. So, but you still need that and the collateral material if you're gonna present to 
yeah, in my case, it was a, a painting product. So you're going to go to the big, big companies. So do you help with that? Uh, I mean, even a sell sheet is important. Yes, 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 absolutely. The sell sheet is a great way to get your product seen by somebody and a great way to start a door, you know, open the door and kind of just uh, see where it goes with them. Um, also, I recommend a pitch deck, which has a little bit more uh, kind of formality about, you know, who's on the team, what, it, you know, what's the problem solving and, um, you know, what is, what is your ask? What are you looking for? You know, do you, are you looking for a licensing agreement? Are you looking for somebody to invest, um, you know, let's say 50000 or 100000 into your business for, for a set amount of the value of the, the company or the percentage of the company? There's no right. way to do that. But, but most inventors aren't uh, well-versed in even figuring out the, the logistics of that. I mean, you know, to do a pitch deck, you've got to figure out what it's going to cost to manufacture and you've got yeah. to figure out marketing costs and they see the widget in front of them and say, well, I'll show it and they'll love it, <laughs> which yeah. you've seen. The first question they're going to ask is, you know, how much does it cost and how much, can, you know, what's, what's the retail price of it going to be, right? If you're going to show the product to somebody that um, you're trying to get them to license your product. So you want to do the, the work first. You need to do as much of the work as you can. So uh, talking to manufacturers, getting the pricing, understanding how much it's going to cost to ship it. Uh, like you were talking about, protecting the invention with as much as you can. Uh, at least a provisional patent. And um, you know, if, you, if you're, if you're um, head set on a, uh, a certain name, like you were saying, you definitely need to do a trademark search and, and trademark the name. It's not that expensive um, in the long run for um, you know, for to trademark uh, a product's name. And, uh, well, I think with that being said, I think you have to test the market a little bit before you spend money on all of those things. But what I'm talking about, I think on your website, it says you do websites and you yep. do, so you'll do, I come to you with a, a, a paint product, you'll do the graphics. I mean, I know you would have already done the, the drawings uh, to make the prototypes, but uh, you have the capability to maybe uh, put all Absolutely. that package together for that pitch deck. Is that in my... Absolutely, we can help with all of that. Uh, basically creating the sales sheet. Um, we, we could take photography of the prototype if it's looking good. If it's not, if the prototype isn't a photography ready for prototype, we can do photorealistic renderings. Um, you know, so if you have a 3D file, we can do a lot more, right? And uh, yeah, so we can do animations as well. Yeah. Oh, you do? Because I mean, in, in obviously today's landscape, video is all important. Here we are on video. Um, you don't live that, you, your place is in South Florida. It's in Hollywood, Florida. Yes. I'm uh, probably 45 minutes up the road from you, but still we're not getting together right now because of uh, the... <laughs> because of the world as it is uh, yeah. so you can put all those things that 3d video let's say to send to uh, to pitch Absolutely. i mean Absolutely. i think a lot of times that goes much further than a one minute video goes much further than sometimes a pitch deck because they want to see if they even like it yeah it's, right? more exciting, it's more dynamic you know, you, you can capture their, their attention. And then after you've captured their attention, then, you know, all right, let, now let's talk some numbers. Let's, let's start the conversation, you know, um, and, and feed them into that pitch deck, which has all your, your, your you know, we are ask. Right. And I, I'm going to just ask for the people listening, do you have relationships with manufacturers and are they, in this country because we know the world has changed again still yep so i have relationships with manufacturers overseas and in america um, you know i'm actually working the next phase of line design is actually to start doing some of our own injection molding as well that's the next phase that we're looking into so um, looking at uh, creating the space needed for us to have injection molded equipment and at least for the smaller items maybe things that are out around this big I'm going to focus on creating those myself and, you know, I want to bring manufacturing back to the States. There's no reason why we, should, we can't do it. You know, there's a lot of technology, um, you know, I'm going to be experimenting with a lot with also uh, 3d printed molds, which let you be able to have a mold in a, in a week versus three months. 
So um, these are different things that, that I'm going to be implementing here in the next uh, six months or so in my company. And uh, but those but, are for smaller pieces. So uh, yeah, like things the size of uh, you know, like a large apple or so, right? Okay. And, um, and yeah, that, so I'm going to be looking at doing more of that kind of stuff, more short run capabilities um, is what I'm trying to add to my team next. And, but yeah, I have relationships with people with different manufacturers overseas, you know, China. Um, and, you know, uh, that's where most of the stuff gets made, you know, at an at a affordable price where they'll do, do everything. They'll package it, they'll wrap it, they'll get it ready for you. And, you know, and in the States, it's a little bit trickier. You know, there's a, not everybody is capable of, of doing the, the whole run of packaging and preparation and everything. It takes a lot of space and um, a lot of people to do the whole thing. So that's why I still go back. Currently, I'm still working a lot with uh, China and uh, getting things made there. And all the molds are made over there as well. I'd say like 95% of all molds are, are made overseas there in China. And are the molds that you're having made, um, obviously it's to your specifications after you've done the engineering work for these pieces for, let's say, yeah. a product I want. Um, are they um, aluminum molds or are they um, beefier than that, let's say? Um, for short runs, aluminum molds is the way to go. If you want to make more than 100,000 pieces or 50,000 pieces plus, then you would start looking at using steel molding. Okay, because I know steel molding is, is a lot more expensive. Yeah, it's harder to work with, much harder to create the cavities in the molds. And, and I, I'm not sure, um, you know, who, what inventors or people you're working with, but don't you find that you would want them to do a short run before they go into a full run? Because there's Absolutely. all, we all, you and I know, but a lot of new inventors don't know that a lot of times that first run is horrible or something didn't work right. And it's not for lack of planning, but right. then you get, you actually get it in your hands and you say it, it doesn't feel right or it's too big or this I part agree. needs, you know. This is a perfect example here. This is a product uh, it's called the Atolis. And this is one of the clients that is currently selling in the market. And this is for eyeglasses. You would Push, put these on the ends of your legs of the eyeglasses and it floats. And oh, for so, boaters. Yep. Good. And um, yeah, I mean, the product came out great. The, uh, you know, the packaging looks really good. It's all eco-friendly packaging. And, you know, but he made it a little bit too big. I had made it, we, we designed it smaller. And then when I took them to the manufacturer, they ended up making it bigger. And now the next round, they're, they're coming back and then they're going to make it smaller again. Right. So, so I, yeah, I mean, it happens and it happens all the time and first run isn't it doesn't mean yeah. final run there's always revisions so yeah. i guess i would say that for the new person that's doing this that they would want to start with a short run um, yeah yeah so it, it depends i'd say it also depends on the product and how much it's been proven before or how much interest you have in it currently um you know, sometimes like, it, and it also depends if you go crowdsourcing, for example, you know, you're, you're, you're using the crowd's money. So, you know, the risk isn't as much. So if the product doesn't come out perfect, perfect on the first time, Hey, that's part of product development. We're going to get, you know, we're going to learn from this and we're going to make it even better on the second one. And, and everything can always be better, right? There's always a, a refinement that can be made or a cost can be reduced or something can have a, a you know, a more eco-friendly material. There's, lots of different ways to uh, be able to add improvements onto the product. And when, and have you done the, um, have you helped anybody with doing a, a crowdfunding? Yes, we have. And uh, I'll just be upfront with everyone that, you know, it's crowdfunding is not guaranteed. You're not guaranteed to. No. <laughs> it depends on the product. It depends on how much you set as your base. Um, if you're using Kickstarter, if you don't hit that, let's say 10,000, if you don't hit that number, you, everybody gets their money back basically for the pre-orders. It doesn't go through, but you can do things on Indiegogo, other platforms, and there's other platforms that you basically, if you raise, if you're trying to go for 10 and you hit seven, they'll give you the seven basically. Right. And that's, um, I just realized I, it must be getting uh, cloudy outside because all of a sudden it got dark in here. Um, 
Yeah, crowdfunding is not for everybody and you really, you're doing a lot of selling for that. You don't just put it up on a, a platform and hope for the best. Yeah, it's you have a full to, yeah, campaign. Yep, yeah, absolutely is. And you need to get everybody who's showed any interest in your product, you got to get them in there and to put their 10 or $20 in. Um, so we helped a client named, uh, his name is um, Dale. He was uh, doing a product called the Sud Stud, which is a like a silicone sleeve that you can fit over soap, right? Soap bars. So it, it stretches over the, the soap. Um, and I, I, I can show pictures. I don't know if I can share my screen or, or how that works. Oh, well, I'll just tell you about it. So um, okay. it's basically a silicone sleeve with holes in it that it, you can put the soap bar in and then you can scrub yourself with it, right? So it uses less soap and uh, it's less mucky at the end when you store the soap and it's got like a thing for you can put like, soap on a rope on it. So um, that pro that client, he funded 60000 on Kickstarter. We basically, he ran the campaign. We helped him. We gave them marketing material created animations and photorealistic renderings and just some different graphics and mock-ups, infographics. And from that, he, he posted it on social media. He, you know, you have to have an email, a marketing a, uh, email blast going out to everybody weekly um, and, and just be on every, every network that you can be on. Right. And he did it and he's now going back and he's doing a second one right now. It's actually live on Kickstarter right now for his version two of the product. So I know he made over a hundred thousand on the first one between, um, you know, the crowdfunding and the, the sales that he was able to create off the first run. So this is, this can definitely be a profitable, uh, endeavor if, uh, you know, if you have a good product and the good thing is also try to keep it simple. You know, if it's a first product that you're working on, keep it as small as possible and keep it as simple as possible because the more parts you have, the more molds you have, and then, you know, 10,000 turns into 20, 30,000 in molds very quickly if you have a lot of complicated parts. Yeah, I didn't get that memo. <laughs> <laughs> my, first be, my first one was rather big, and uh, yeah, the molds were very expensive, and yeah, it, it, was, it was a different world 15 years ago, and a lot has happened. I mean, with prototyping and uh, stainless steel molds, because nobody was making them at that point for even short run. It was it was less likely. But who does your graphic design? Um, my team does. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, how many people are on your team? I'm working with around ten designers right now. Oh, wow. Designers, mechanical, and electrical. Wow, I didn't realize that, that you had that many people. I knew you did a lot, but that's a lot. And then you have somebody that can work on websites? Absolutely, yep. So do they? I have, I have a couple different people that I work with on my websites. Right. And, and, you know, usually I have, I, I test them on my website first, make sure they know what they're doing, or I'll give them a, a project that's, uh, you know, not a client project. Anytime I'm working with a new um, web developer, um, yeah, but well, we have two amazing guys that are, that, you know, can guarantee results basically. And, oh, uh, good. What I'm doing. and the website is also the search engine optimization. There's so many things to the website that, I mean, I'm learning all the time. I'm going to be honest, you know, like, um, you know, like the faster your website is, the better Google rates your website. Right. So, you know, so it's important to go in there and reduce the size of images, label them correctly. Um, and you know those kind of things help a lot it's then, funny because i've had some quotes from people for seo and you look at what they're sending and they haven't even labeled a photo it's they'll just have it as an image name and emma i didn't know that uh, you know that yeah. all of that counts towards your your seo yeah. which is yeah. quite interesting well your website i'm just gonna throw it out here now is lime creative design.com mm -hmm. and i'm going to put that of course in the notes and um you're you do so much that it's pretty amazing that there are, you've put it all in one spot or pretty much all in one spot yeah that's, that's really helpful because most people don't know i would say first who to go to second and probably more importantly who can they trust with their money? 
because money's at a premium when you're starting out. You always think that it's going to cost a few dollars and it's a few hundred or a few thousand and it can get out of hand rather quickly if you don't have somebody that can guide yeah. you through it and who you trust and who's proven. Mm -hmm. That's great. Your website's great, by the way. It looks really good. So whoever's working on it now besides you, it looks good. Yep. It's, uh, uh, I do a lot of it, but I also have specialists come in for certain parts of it, you know, so for like the search engine optimization, um, that kind of stuff, I'll bring somebody in, but for the actual design and the, the writing and all that kind of stuff, we've kind of just gone over it so many times and, and refined it as through the years. Cause the website's a living, breathing, um, it's a portfolio, right? It's your contact. So, and especially now you need to be able to have a good website to send people to so they can learn more about your product. They can sign up for your newsletter because that's really important because then that's when you can kind of tie everything in because maybe they don't, you know, maybe they'll forget about you, right? There's so much noise on the internet but they'll get that email blast like you got from me. And, uh, you know, and I was happy to have that response from you on that. So that was cool. Well, like I said, I knew you did prototypes. I've known for a long time and we've go, we go back <laughs> quite a few years, but, um, I, until I actually went to the website, I didn't know you had all of these other ancillary, um, services that are, that are critical when you're doing it. I mean, you can have a great product, but if you can't, convey that information because we're not seeing people face to face anymore it, it's it's more important now to do that correctly you're absolutely correct so are you working on any uh products that you've created just curious i am i am actually let me show you one this is one that my partner and i were actually able to uh, one second we were able to fund about a hundred thousand dollars and we got our project to a certain point where we were beginning licensing agreements. Uh, unfortunately, the one that we were working on fell through, so we're starting another. We're, we're starting to work with the next team. But basically, this is an electrical magnetic plug. So this goes into the wall, let's say, into your wall socket, and then this would plug into your phone charger, and basically, it just it just pulls itself in. So it's a magnetic plug for uh, standard devices for 15 amp devices. Oh, wow. Very fun. This is a very complicated product because of all the electronics and we're dealing with, with, with uh, you know, high voltage. Um, so, yeah, so that's one that we're working on right now. Um, just also, this one here is a, a bag that, we, that I made for, uh, for uh, vacuum cleaners that, for the pool. We have so many pools in South Florida. So, let me grab this real quick. So this one's, uh, I'm working with the manufacturers being done overseas. And uh, we have this product right now. Uh, basically, the guy who I'm selling them to wholesale, he's selling on Amazon for around $28. And um, we have a, a great partnership. I've, I've made about 10,000 of these already. And if you see here, this is how they use it. It goes on a hammerhead vacuum, which is the standard for the professionals in the pool cleaning industry. Oh, okay. Oh, for pool clean. Yes. Got it. So this is a cut and sew product, which is also nice for people that have cut and sew products because you don't have to spend all that money on tooling. Right. So there's a huge advantage there. And this is made to fit multiple sizes, all high quality. So this is another product that I'm having a lot of success with. So it's not always plastic parts that, you know, it's, you know, a lot of these cut and sew products are, are easy to do and, you know, um, can be a great product to add to uh, your lineup. So with these guys, actually, we um, worked on the packaging as well because it, you know just we needed something to get out when we started. But then we came in and revamped the design, make it stand out more, give it right. more feel. You know, when you have more time, you you tweak what you can. Well, I think that goes back to starting with an original idea and then. Um, it evolves as you either get customers or feedback from, yeah. you know, from, and like you said, on packaging, it's critical because it's got to stand out if you're, well, the noise on the internet. So if it's on whatever Amazon or however they're selling it, 
that's that's real important because you have what a couple seconds to catch somebody's attention yeah yeah that's really hard wow so those are ones that somebody else created or you created uh i created the bag um it was a uh, uh i did it as a partnership and um basically i'm making them did the packaging work with the manufacturer get it imported into the country and uh and then from there it gets distributed wow and that was that was that done with a crowdfunding as well no no this was not this was done with just uh hard up, work <laughs> up, up, hard work and upfront money yeah uh, i made an investment of and and the thing is also soft goods like these it's easier to do like 100 pieces or 200 right. pieces right so i was able to do on the first run i did a thousand pieces and my investment with shipping and everything um, at that time was around five thousand for that. So, you know, we saved up saved up enough money to get that first order put in, and from there, basically, it's history. You know, next, but then after that, it's about refining your product, and how can I reduce the cost? Well, the the easiest way to reduce the cost is to buy more, right? So, right, twenty five hundred on the next order, and that drops it. You know, I dropped it about a dollar a piece or so, and you know, from there, it's history. You know, we just keep keep doing it, keep finding the good partners that, that, that like the product that you're creating. And I just keep hitting the repeat button and, you know, try to make a couple, you know, buy, buy a couple, you know, buy maybe twice a year or so. And who knows where it can grow to. Um, we're not even really fo focusing a lot of our energy on the marketing for that. We, we have, we have, uh, you know, one company that buys from us and we just, you know, provide to them right now and um, just focus on making new products. That's really great. Uh, well, and, and it goes back to multiple streams of income could, because you can't rely on just one thing. You can't, and yeah. probably in your case, you can't just rely on making prototypes because not everybody has the money for that. But the ones that do still need marketing or they'll need a sell sheet or they'll need all the rest of the things that you do. And wow. like, in regards to the prototypes, what's important is really like the design and engineering is it's you know what I'm saying it's without that you can't have a prototype right you got to design something correctly and then you got to tweak it to work mechanically um, so really it's the design engineering and then the prototyping the prototyping is really kind of proving out our concepts in th that we created in 3d and, and sketched out and you know we really like to go back and take a, a close look at everything and see how we can expand the invention and then bring it back to just what it needs um, so Normally, when we do a concept, we'll do you know three concepts for the client, and then we'll we'll kind of morph it into the fourth concept. Wow, uh, this has uh, been very enlightening for me. Be and I do need to follow up with you later about one of the other products I've got. But I, I think this has been a wealth of information for our inventors and all the other people that you know. A lot of people have ideas, and they. That's been my thing. They don't know where to go or where to start or again, back to trust. Who can they trust? Yeah. Who has the, not only the expertise, but um, the, the value. And you certainly have all of that. I'm gonna uh, put all of this information in the, um, in the details so that people can reach out to you. Um, What's the best email for somebody so I can add that? Because I've got your website and your phone number, but what's the best? Is it on the website? Uh, you can send it to info at limecreativedesign.com. Oh, okay. I can, I can add that one too. Well, thank you so much for enlightening me and um, everybody else. You can reach Rodrigo at limecreativedesign.com. I'll put the number in the um, in the notes. All right. And thank you so much for joining us. If anybody has any questions, they can or would like to be on a podcast with me, um, they can call. They can reach out to me at Carolyn at inventingdaily.com, and please follow us on the YouTube and also with this podcast. Thanks, Rodrigo, and I will be in touch soon. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It was really fun. You know, we talked about a lot of things. You know, there's, there's so many parts of design. It's like I see it like an umbrella, you know. 
and um, that's why you know our, our it's just a, there's a lot of things that, that that we touch on when we're developing products and oh it and you can't possibly do it all in a short show so I'm going to be getting back with you because we're going to do this again. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye bye.